But the unseen realm is more powerful, it has more potential, and it is where our authority lies. Again, it is the place where righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost are our divine empowerment to release the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Hey, this is Pastor Jason Hooper with Kingsway Church and Kingsway College, and I want to welcome you to Kingdom Living. You know, this is a new broadcast. It's a new platform and a new show from Kingsway Church that we are so excited to offer you to give a prophetic perspective on current events, but also to look at what does the life of a spirit-filled, spirit-led believer look like in this hour? Because our responsibility is not simply to go to heaven. God's responsibility is to get us to heaven through the finished work of his son. Our responsibility is to reveal our Father to an orphan planet. It is to manifest the power of God and to uh, see the kingdom of God come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for years, so many people in the church have been focused on getting out of here. But what if I was to tell you that kingdom living is not about what you go through, it's about what God is able to grow you through. It's not about getting out of a situation or being delivered from a hard time, but it's recognizing that all things will work together for my good because bless God, I'm called and I love Jesus with all my heart. It's recognizing that if things happen to us, they don't have to happen in us because we are born from above and we are living from a different perspective. It is a kingdom perspective. It is, the, it is the perspective of Jesus when he was approaching his destination on Calvary and when he was carrying that cross and, and so many as they were cursing and spitting and as the, the devil thought that he had, he had won. How many of you know that Jesus knew that what he was walking through was temporary, but the temporary that he was walking through would release something that was eternal. And there is an invitation this hour to get our eyes off of the temporal and to set the affection of our heart on that which is eternal. Because suffering lasts for a moment, but his glory is forever. Amen? And that is what you and I are called to. Not simply a glory reserved for heaven when you die, but that we would experience a greater glory, a latter glory in these last days. You know, so many people look at uh, current events and, and try to interpret uh, the signs of Jesus coming and uh, the, the signs of where are we um, on the timeline of biblical and world history. And while we need to discern the times and seasons we're in, more than being focused on what Jesus, more than being focused on when Jesus is coming back, I don't know about you, but my heart is focused on how do we invade, occupy, and transform now? And so I'm not looking for him to come back a moment too soon. My Bible says in Acts chapter 3, we're called to repent, to be converted, that times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord, whom the heavens must retain until the restoration of all things. That means that oftentimes when people are, are praying prayers to get out of a situation, they're actually not uh, really looking at their situation through a kingdom perspective. They're looking at it from being delivered from uh, something that uh, is painful in the moment. But if they would recognize that God is working something in me that will begin to produce through me instead of just delivering me, they could actually begin to rejoice and count it all joy when they experience diverse trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of their faith produces patience. Isn't that what James told us in James chapter 1? And what does it look like for your faith to be tested? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so for your faith to be tested means that you've heard God, He spoke to your heart, but what you see in, in, what you see in the world around you, life around you, tries to speak louder than the truth of God in you. And that is a place to count it all joy, to double down on what God has said, because faith and patience, when partnered together, will inherit the promise of God. And in Matthew 24, it's a passage that, of course, many people look to in this hour. I want to give you a kingdom encouragement for how to look at this, not in a way that would look for what's wrong, but look for how can we release righteousness, peace, and joy in this hour and see the kingdom of God advance. 
One of the things we see in the book of Acts is whenever there's persecution, it didn't cause the gospel to pull back. It actually caused the gospel to go farther faster. Amen? And these are the days of multiplication. These are the days of increase. These are the days of abundance, but these are also the days of pressing. Amen? And we know that without pressing, there is no oil and there is no wine. So these are days of fullness. And some of that fullness is revealed by what is coming against you, because when you get pressed, it reveals what you've cultivated on the inside. And I want to encourage you that you're carrying the greatness of God on the inside. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when a hopeless situation tries to press on a hope-filled believer, guess what's released? Christ, the fullness of his glory. Hallelujah. But if someone is in a hopeless situation and they don't have Christ in them, the hope of glory, what is released is not Christ, but it's more crisis. And that's what we're seeing in the world right now. We're seeing the pressing of current events actually creating an internal crisis that is multiplying conflict. But we are called to be the difference, amen? Because Jesus has not left himself without a body in the earth. Isn't that what he said in Hebrews? So in Matthew chapter 24, verse three, Jesus, it says that now he sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately asking three things. One, tell us when these things will be. Two, what will be the sign of your coming? And three, of uh, the, the sign of the end of the age. And he goes on to talk about how in the last days, uh, there would be many attempts to deceive the body of Christ, even the elect. In verse four, Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one de deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, and then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Yay! Come on, how many of you get excited about that? Hallelujah. You say, I don't know about that. Well, my Bible says that through many tribulations, we enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? It says in Mark 10, Jesus says, now all of us love, love hundredfold harvest, amen? Jesus said that no one leaving father, mother, son, daughter, or houses uh, for his sake, he said that everyone who does that in the earth now will reap a hundredfold in this life and the time to come with persecution. And so one of the things I wanna tell you is, is oftentimes God will actually bring increase into your life and the increase does not come without conflict, but the conflict the pressing is actually to release multiplication. It's not to divide, it's not to subtract, but it's to cause us to lean even more into God's grace and to recognize that with God, nothing is impossible. But just like Jesus said, of ourselves, we can do nothing. And so everything that goes on in the world around us is actually allowing us to lean more into the Lord to rely more on his word, to take a firm stand on firm stand of faith on the foundation of what God has said, regardless of what we have seen. Now, again, I know that there, of course, we can, we can look at how much of this passage has already come to pass in the first 70 years after Christ's death. We can look at, okay, what are the prophetic applications to now? So in other words, what was then, what's now, what's to come? But what I want us to draw our focus from is, is just a few verses where I believe it is the responsibility of spirit-filled, spirit-led believers who are living kingdom lives in this hour to rise and shine so the glory of the Lord be seen upon us and that we can release his light in dark situations. Verse 10 says this, and many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. And one of the things that we've recognized in the world is, is just how easily people can become offended. And one of the things about offense is whenever we find ourselves offended, we actually have found a place in us, a part of who we are that 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 is the old man. It's 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 not it's the part of us that has not been put off considering considering the former conduct. It, it's it's the part of us where Jesus is not Lord. It's the part of us that is not really dead. It has not really been raised again because the area of your offense is the area that you see yourself as Lord. 
the area that you see yourself as more deserving than what you have received. An offense always reveals a spirit of entitlement. Offense, whenever someone's offended, it's because they feel like that they are owed more than what they were just given, whether it was a communication, honor, respect, compensation for work being done, whatever it could be. Because offense is a choice. And the thing about offense is it leads to unbelief. And if unbelief is not simply the lack of faith, unbelief is actually deliberate partnership with the demonic realm that wars against the revealed will of God in your life. I'm gonna say that again. Unbelief is not simply the lack of faith. It's not simply living from a place of fear, but it's the willful partnership with the demonic realm that opposes the manifested will of God in your life. And Jesus here talks about how it's offense that leads to betrayal and hatred that ultimately will produce unbelief. Verse 11 says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophets can also be translated false witnesses or talebearers. And I mean, even in today's news, there are so many reports of false witness, false accusation, fake news, hallelujah, tale bearers, and really false voices and false narratives that have deceived so many in, 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 in our country, the nation of America, but throughout the world. And honestly, it is because of offense, because offense opens the door to deception. And the thing about deception, it is deceiving. If you are deceived, you are typically the last one to know. In fact, you oftentimes think that you are the only one who is right. And if you have, have you've ever found yourself in that narcissistic place and that you feel that, that everybody else is wrong and you're the only one that's right, you might be deceived. Hallelujah. You might have been offended. That may be an opportunity to where you can come to the Lord and say, hey, is there anything in me? That, that, that the enemy has a hook in? Is there anything in me that I'm not seeing clearly? Is there anything in me that you're wanting to uh, put your fire on so that it can come up out of me so I can look more like you in this season? Because if anybody could have been offended, it would have been Jesus. But he chose to say, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And one of the things that keeps you from living, keep, that keeps you from experiencing offense is not prejudging or predetermining the motive in someone's heart behind what they did. In other words, when we, when we find ourselves as judge, jury, and lawyer, where, where we say why somebody did something, we cast blame whether they're guilty or not guilty, and then we, um, and then we uh, execute a sentence or a consequence or a punishment, we in that place are partnering with the accuser. And the enemy has no power. He has no authority unless you give him yours because you've been given all. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful you've been given all? And let's not give the devil an inch. And if you have given some to him, repentance will always take back what the enemy has stolen. He goes on to say, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So again, offense is aimed at your love. Entitlement is working against your empowerment. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who is able to bear all things, hope all things, endure all things, believe all things. But verse 14 is where I really want us to look. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Amen. Paul said in Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. First Corinthians chapter two, Paul said uh, that his preaching was not with an excellence of speech, but a demonstration of power, that our faith would not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Amen. Acts 1 8 says that we've been given what? Power to be a witness. What does a witness do? They testify to what they have seen with their eyes, heard with their ears, and touched with their hand. And so the gospel of the kingdom is a witness to all nations. And Jesus said that the end can't come until that gospel is preached. Remember, in Acts 3, it says that the heavens must retain him until the restoration of all things. 
And Jesus is not returning on a rescue mission. He is coming to receive a restored planet and a redeemed people. He is coming back for, for, when, 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 for, for a planet that has been returned back to what was lost in the garden. The dominion, the, uh, the fruitfulness, the image in which we are created, and the fruitfulness of fellowship that we're called to walk in. And so I want to encourage you. What's happening in the world around you is actually speaking to what God has put in you. The more crazy things get in your life, the more bold you need to get about the life of Jesus, the truth of the gospel, and the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, many of you are watching right now, God is calling you into a ministry of deliverance, and that's why there's been such a demonic manifestation in the world around you. In other words, think about it like this in Mark chapter four, verse 35. Jesus tells the disciples, he says, hey guys, listen, we're going to the other side. Has Jesus ever told you that he wants to take you somewhere? And then it seems like as soon as you started to follow Jesus, all hell broke loose, hallelujah. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples. And they quickly forgot what Jesus said because of what they could so easily see. And I wanna tell you, the seen realm is always warring against the unseen realm. But the unseen realm is more powerful, it has more potential, and it is where our authority lies. Again, it is the place where righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost are our divine empowerment to release the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? And so Jesus tells the disciples, we're going to the other side. The winds begin to blow, the rain begins to fall, the waves begin to roll. And what happened was the boat began to take on water. Now, a boat in water doesn't sink, but water in a boat will cause the boat to sink. What does that speak of? It speaks of the cares of this life, the worry, the pride of life, the deceitfulness of riches, all of those things that Jesus said in Mark 4, choke out the word and cause it to be unfruitful. When, when, when those things get in us, we begin to feel like that we're sinking. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone or maybe in a situation and you've, you've had almost kind of that like, uh, you, you feel like that you've got a loss of breath or you're sinking? What that is, is right then is the enemy is overplaying his hand. I want to encourage you, when you have felt that, it is because the enemy is intimidated and he's trying to get you to back up and to begin to think about a problem instead of speaking God's promise. See, when, that, when the wind and the waves showed up, Jesus was taking a nap and the disciples did not need to wake him because the word that Jesus gave them had the power to get them to the other side. What would have been an appropriate response of faith? See, they reacted in fear. They woke up Jesus and said, don't you care about us? They began to question God. They began to question his heart. And he had so proven his heart to them. He had so proven that he was God in flesh, that he was the miracle man. Hallelujah. He had multiplied fish. He had multiplied loaves. He had opened blind eyes. He had raised the dead. He had cleansed the leper. He had cast out devils. What was a storm? A little storm. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't. And then he prayed it would and it did. And so they had a biblical precedent to not be afraid. And they had clear prophetic and practical direction that, hey, Jesus said we're going to the other side. And if the waves are trying to say no, if the wind is trying to say you can't, well, we've got it on a greater authority that we can and we will because what God has said will not return to him void, but it'll prosper in the place that he's sending us. And the truth is they were being sent to the other side. Why? Because there was a region that was being tormented by a demoniac. It was the man of the Gadarenes. And he was a man who, he, they tried to bind him with chains and, and he would break the chains off and he would just run around naked, just terrorizing the citizens of that region. But how many of you recognize, listen, principalities work through personalities. And what happened was the demonic principality in the second heaven over that region had found a willing participant in the earth that brought torment. Now, flip it because the devil is a counterfeiter. He can't do anything. He's never had an original idea. He's never come up with, an, with he, has, he has no new ideas. He's never done anything new. He's continuing to try to do today what he always did in the garden. Get us the question, has God said, will God do? And so here you see 
a principality in the second heaven working through one man in the earth. Think about when you look at the impact of, of, of the fear that a man created, flip it to say, okay, there was a demonic principality, a spiritual host of wickedness in, in the second heavens that was working through one person. What about all the host of heaven and the likeness of the Lord that is available to us, not just from a third heaven perspective, but Christ in us, the hope of glory? That we have been anointed in the same way that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power to go about doing good and healing all who are oppressed. That you, you look at what the devil could do through one person in the earth under a demonic spirit. How much more could God do through you as one man, one woman in the earth under the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit? And see, Jesus knew this. He knew that the opposition of what was coming against them wasn't about where they were. It was about where they were going. And I want to encourage you in where you're going, in the places where you've, you've experienced a resistance, a pushing back, where it looks like all hell is breaking loose against you. I've got great news. It's because you have heaven on the inside that's about to break out. And the, what the disciples should have done, a response of faith would be to speak to the wind and to speak to the waves and say, hey, stop it. Peace, be still. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And how many of you know, Jesus' word trumps everything else. But they woke up Jesus, and they began to question his heart. And he woke up, and he spoke to the wind, he spoke to the waves, and he said, peace, be still. And he said, the wind ceased, and the waves stopped. And then he turned to them. Why do you have so little faith? Don't you remember the fish and the loaves? And the truth is, is there was one man on the other side of that storm that needed Jesus. He needed the freedom that could only be found in the sun. Because when they got to the other side, that demoniac came and he fell on his feet before Jesus. And he began to worship still convulsing, still crying out, still under demonic possession, but a greater kingdom had shown up because that man had been living in the kingdom of darkness, but now the kingdom of light and the kingdom of our Lord had showed up in the physical form. The king was on the scene. He spoke to that man. He spoke to the spirits that were tormenting. He said, what is your name? And he said, we are a legion, for we are many. And then he commanded them to come out of that man and to go into the group of pigs. And when, he went, and when they went into the pigs, when they went into the swine, the pigs ran off the side of the cliff and drowned in the water. And what happened was one man's deliverance brought an economic shift that actually shook a region to where they were previously closed off to the gospel because they were like the Laodicean church. We are rich and have need of nothing. But now, all of a sudden, the things that they had depended on had left their life. And because of the testimony of freedom they saw in the man of the Gadarenes, and because of recognizing things they had put their faith in that were no longer serving them, had left their life, their hearts were open to Jesus that so they too could live a kingdom life. And so I want to encourage you in your call to set the captive free, to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to destroy the works of the devil, that you would have radical boldness, that when you find yourself in a storm, you would not judge your situation by what you see. You say, wait a minute, Jesus said I'm going to the other side. And why would I be surprised if a couple demons manifest if I'm called? to set the captive free. Father, for those who are watching and for those who are listening, I bless you to walk in your God-given authority. And I speak a fresh oil and a new anointing to come upon you to not only live a kingdom life, but to think kingdom thoughts, to speak kingdom words, and to manifest kingdom power because there is a world waiting for what is on the inside of you.
to come out and to set them free in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom does not come with observation. It is within you. Jesus said in the last days when many are offended, the antidote to offense, the antidote to deception, hatred and betrayal is the gospel of the kingdom being preached to all nations as a witness. And that is what the Holy Spirit has given you the power to do, to be, and to release this hour. God bless you. Live a kingdom life.